Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson. You know, with every passing day, there's another example of central banks doing something, anything, to rescue or stabilize financial markets, especially the equity and currency markets. To help us understand this better, we have back with us today a man who really needs no introduction, Jim Rickards, seasoned financier, risk manager, and author. And we're going to discuss his latest book, The New Case for Gold, hot off the presses as its release date is April 5th, 2016. Now, Jim is perhaps best known for his expertise in describing how currency wars are one of the most destructive and feared outcomes in international economics, and that history shows they always end badly. And in fact, that is one of the core reasons we've been suggesting gold to our listeners for a long time is because of central bank monetary action more than anything else. Now, in 2014, Jim warned us that the world was going to engage in a new currency war and it was going to pose risks that every prudent individual should be aware of. And of course, we do consider gold to be a form of money at peak prosperity, which is a different thing from being a form of currency a distinction that matters a lot, and maybe we'll get to here today. So, Jim, welcome back. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Chris. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me on your program. Sure. So let's uh, let's set the stage for why you wrote this book, Um, Gold. I I hate to say it, Jim. Uh, It's a long-suffering relic, at least uh, if we go by its price over the last five years. And Grant Williams, who I admire a lot, makes the case that in the West, Uh, Nobody cares about gold. It's beaten down. It's forgotten about by most financial managers in the West. Your new book is making the case that every portfolio should have some gold in it. So let's talk about that. Uh, First, why is gold suffering and forgotten by Western financiers? And and are they making a mistake here? Well, that's a great question. First of all, you're exactly right, Chris. You you can't uh, you can't get in a kind of normal conversation with uh, most people, or certainly monetary elites, uh, university professors, academics, uh, central bankers, uh, you know, et cetera, journalists for that matter, with, with few exceptions. Uh, you can't get into a normal conversation about gold without being either ridiculed or uh, you'll you'll be treated like a gold bug or a gold nut or Neanderthal. I'm kind of used to it all. I've heard it all. Uh, so you need a pretty thick skin to, to be in the space. Uh, but that's the reason I wrote the book. You're exactly right that we now have upwards of three generations of Americans who have either been miseducated, uneducated, or led in a false direction with regard to gold. So 90% of my book, The New Case for Gold, are positive affirmative reasons to have gold in your portfolio. But the first 10% of the book, and part of the motivation for writing it, I had to knock down these anti-gold arguments once and for all. I knew that they don't, I know that they don't hold water. They're empirically, factually, historically, analytically incorrect or obsolete, but you hear them all the time. Uh, I was on uh, Bloomberg with uh, my friend Joe Weisenthal, and he starts calling gold a, a shiny pile of rocks. I said, Joe, it's not a rock, it's a metal. So why don't we start there and get some facts straight? But there, there are half a dozen uh, obsolete canards you hear all the time, and I, I shoot them down one by one. Let me just give you a simple example, Chris. Sure. People, people say that the gold supply does not expand fast enough to support the growth of the world economy. You hear that one all the time. And the fact is mining output relative to total stock is about 1.6% a year, and world growth, you know, it varies, but, you know, between 3 and 4% a year. So people say, hey, if the gold output's growing 1.6% a year and world growth is growing, you know, 3 4% a year, obviously it's going to be deflationary because the, the gold can't keep up with the, with the growth. Well, first of all, that's complete nonsense. Those facts are correct, but they're irrelevant because mining output has nothing to do with the ability of central banks to expand their gold supply and to have discretionary monetary policy. It confuses mining output, official gold, and total gold. As you know, total gold above ground is about 180,000 tons, give or take. But official gold that is gold held by central banks and finance ministries, is only about 35,000 tons. So that leaves 145,000 tons out there that central banks can acquire that has nothing to do with mining output. So if you're a central bank and you want to expand the money supply and you want to have uh, some monetary ease, 
but you're on a gold standard or some kind of modified gold standard, you don't have to wait for the miners to dig it up. All you have to do is go out and buy some gold from the private sector. By the way, that's called an open market operation. It's exactly what the Fed does today in bonds. When the Fed wants to expand the money supply, what do they do? They call the primary dealers, which are the big banks. They buy some bonds. The dealers deliver the bonds, and the Fed pays for them with money that comes out of thin air. So you could call uh, private gold dealers, have a, have a list of primary dealers in gold, call private gold dealers, buy some gold, pay for it with money that comes out of thin air. So if you want to expand your gold base and you want to expand your money supply and you want to conduct discretionary monetary policy, it has nothing to do with mining output. You can just go buy some private gold. So when you say that, people go, oh, yeah, I get that. I understand that. So that's, that's one falsehood you can knock down. The other one, of course, uh, you know, there's not enough gold to uh, support world trade and commerce. That's another nonsensical uh, uh, statement. There's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. At $1,250 an ounce, if you want to have a gold standard, not a good idea. That's highly deflationary. But at $10,000 an ounce, it's not deflationary. It's mildly inflationary. So it's never about the gold supply. It's about the price. Uh, I think going to a gold standard at twelve fifty would be would be a disaster. Same thing, same mistake Winston Churchill made in 1925 when he went to gold at about $20 an ounce. That was disastrous. By the way, the person who told Churchill not to do it. Churchill was Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, which is like kind of like Treasury Secretary. The person who told Churchill not to do it, he said, go to gold at a much higher price, meaning at the time about $40 an ounce, was John Maynard Keynes. Now, Keynes has this reputation as a gold basher, but I, in my book, The New Case for Gold, I talk about how Keynes actually understood gold very well. Uh, by the way, he never called gold a barbarous relic. That's another thing you hear. When he used the phrase barbarous relic, he was referring to a flawed gold exchange standard of the 1920s. And he was right about that. It was flawed because the price was wrong. So again, I take these argu these anti-gold arguments. You hear them. They're all friends of mine, by the way, whether it's Barry Ritholtz or uh, you know, Joe Weisenthal. Uh, I mean, they're, they're good people, but they just don't get it. Um, so my book... Um, you know, I'm not a gold dealer. I don't get paid a commission if somebody buys gold. Uh, I am an author. I am an analyst. I wanted to provide an educational function. So first, I knock down the anti-gold arguments, and none of them hold water. Then I spend the rest of the book giving you very good reasons why you should have gold. Well, Jim, let me let me get to, I think, uh, one of my favorite uh, gold bashing pieces, which uh, we have to discuss now, which is which was this. People used to throw this out like it was very, very astute, very savvy thing to say. Hey, gold has no yield. Uh, well, now I can at least rejoin that and, and come back and say, well, at least it doesn't have a negative yield. Uh, certainly, the, this negative yield environment has to be gold positive, I would think. Uh, but from, from your view, how is this negative yield environment actually working? And, and should we expect that it's going to influence this new case for gold? Right. Well, gold has no yield. Is one. You're absolutely right, right, Chris. It's one of the most frequent anti-gold comments you hear. You hear it prominently from people like Warren Buffett. Of course, Warren Buffett is the king of tax-deferred uh, compounding, so he likes his yield. Um, uh, but you'll hear it from talking heads and TV anchors, and you, you hear it all the time. Well, well, there are two answers to it. One is the one you just mentioned, which is that in a world of negative interest rates, zero yield is the high-yield asset. Right, because mm -hmm. zero is greater than negative one, so uh, that makes gold a very attractive one and so on. But there's there's another answer that applies even in a positive rate environment that I think is a little more to the point, which is that right, gold has no yield. That's true. It's not supposed to. It's money. Take a dollar bill out of your out of your wallet. Reach in your wallet or your purse. Pull out a dollar bill. Hold it up in front of you. What's the yield? Zero. You don't get any yield on your money. Now, people say, oh, well, I can put it in the bank and get a yield, you know, 25 basis points, whatever, maybe, until you get to negative rates. But it, when you put it in the bank, it's not money anymore. It's a bank deposit. What is a bank deposit legally? A bank deposit is an unsecured liability of an occasionally insolvent financial institution. Hmm. What, is a, what is a money market fund? A money market fund is a share of an SEC-registered fund. And by the way, last year, the, and very few people noticed this, the SEC changed the rules so that money market funds can suspend redemptions for the first time. They were never allowed to do that before last year. Hedge funds, of course, can suspend redemptions whenever they want. But it didn't used to be the case with money market funds. So people have money, and these are all misnomers, right? Money market fund. Forget the word money. Think about market. People say, I have money, in my, I have my money in a money market fund. They think they can call their broker give a sell order, and the money will be in their bank account the next day. 
guess what? Let me tell you all the things that can go wrong. First of all, now in a panic, the money market fund can suspend redemption, so you can't get your money. Number two, even if it goes to the bank, who's to say the bank's open? Who's to say the bank's not insolvent? What if the power grid goes down? What if Vladimir Putin hacked it? Uh, what if the bank closes, which, as, by the way, I say these things and people roll their eyes and go, well, that'll never happen. Yeah. Every one of them has happened. 1933, by executive order, all the banks were closed. 1914, the New York Stock Exchange was closed for five months. Months, not days. How many people know that? From July to December 1914, the New York Stock Exchange was closed. Vladimir Putin has a 6,000-member cyber brigade. These are not criminal hackers trying to get your credit card number. These are Russian military and intelligence assets working day and night to destroy, hack, disrupt, delete, and erase every digital asset in the world. I say to people, you know, I talk to people, uh, you know, meet people in Greenwich, Connecticut, they're billionaires. Uh, I say, what do you got? They go, oh, I got stocks, bonds, all this. I say, no, you don't. You're a billionaire. What do you have are, are electrons. You have digital wealth. You may get a paper statement from your broker or bank once a month, but it's all in digital form. It can be wiped out and erased. And people say, well, that will never happen. Guess what? It happened last week. The country of Bangladesh, one of the poorest countries in the world, had $100 million on deposit with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York that disappeared. And it wasn't on deposit with some rinky-dink bank in Bangladesh. In theory, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is the safest bank in the world. Here's a poor country, and $100 million disappeared. By the way, if they'd had that money in physical gold, they'd still have their $100 million. So every one of these things has happened. Every one of these things is coming. Um, I don't say sell everything and buy gold. I don't say pull all your money out of the bank and buy gold. I do say take 10% of your investable assets, put it in physical gold, put it in safe non-bank storage, and you will weather the storm. I couldn't agree more. And 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 what's intriguing to me, Jim, is is that uh, what you're talking about is just buying insurance. And uh, unlike an insurance policy where you dump the premium and if nothing bad happens, all you're left with is nothing. Uh, gold is a form of insurance where it's always going to have some value, maybe in dollar terms, higher or lower than when you bought the insurance policy. But you're talking about prudent insurance given. Um, real risks that we can see. You know, you mentioned Putin hacking. It was two years ago, I think, Symantec released this, I thought, alarming report saying, oh, hey, somebody out of Eastern Europe, we think, got root level admin access to our uh, nation's power infrastructure grid, you know, and it made little waves like in Wired.com. I, I saw a little mention of it in some newspapers, and I don't think it really got widely circulated because it's an, actually a very scary thought. And that was the one we found out about. There was a Trojan horse that inserted some malware that gave them root level access. Somebody, we don't know who, but let's imagine for the moment, Eastern Europe is close to Russia or somebody could be China, doesn't matter. And what you're saying is, look, these are known things. We've already seen that, that you know, there's a big global game of, of chicken and, and hacking going on and something could, ha could come from that. So to me, that's just a prudent, you know, A goes to B goes to C. Somewhere along the line, it makes sense to have your wealth out of the system and physical assets, and yet people still resist it. Uh, first, why? And second, how do, you, how do you approach that in your book? Well, for, the reason why is, you know, we discussed earlier, Chris, which is this, again, call it uh, conditioning, miseducation, brainwashing, take your pick. But since the mid-1970s, gold has not been taught in um, universities and economics departments and education. I was sort of fortunate. I, I got a graduate degree in international economics, but my class, uh, class of 74, was the last class that was taught gold as a monetary asset. You know, everyone says the gold standard ended in 1971 uh, with Richard Nixon. That's not quite correct. Richard Nixon, on August 15, 1971, suspended redemption of dollars for gold. That's true. But that was not the end of the gold standard. It kind of struggled along for a couple of years. It wasn't until 1974 that the International Monetary Fund officially de monetized gold and then we went to the world of floating exchange rates where we've been ever since but my year 73 74 i studied gold and actually my professors right so i'm a 25 year old grad student uh, but my professors were in their 50s they were the young guns when i am when the imf was created in the in 1944 in the early 1950s so i was taught by the professors who had created and administered the imf in its early years and I study gold in the monetary context. If you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they don't teach it in academic mm -hmm. economics departments with very few exceptions. So we just don't know about gold. And uh, by the way, it's the number one trick of a propagandist, right? Uh, either don't talk about something, as George Orwell said, send it down the memory hole, or if you do talk about it, lie about it. 
And, uh, you know, remember the famous interview with Ben Bernanke and uh, talking to uh, George Washington University students a couple of years ago. And what, you know, I love lecturing and, and, and meeting with students because they always ask the smartest questions because they haven't been totally brainwashed yet. And uh, so one of the students raises his hand and says to Chairman Bernanke, you know, Mr. Chairman, um, if gold is uh, so irrelevant, why does the United States have 8,000 tons? And Chairman Bernanke says, well, you know, it's a tradition. You know, he used the word tradition, just kind of threw it out there and moved on. Well, you know what? It was a good question. Why does the U.S. have 8,000 tons? Why does China have more than 5,000 tons? Why has Russia acquired 1,000 tons in the past six years? Why did, why did the 19 members of the Eurozone have 10,000 tons? Why does the IMF have 2,000 tons? What's up with all this gold if it has no role? Well, of course it has a role. It's propping up the Fed. By the way, I talk about that in Chapter 1 of my book. I explain how the Fed is periodically insolvent and is leveraged 100 to 1, over 100 to 1, if you don't count the gold on their balance sheet. But if you do take the gold on the balance sheet and mark to market, they look pretty healthy. They're leveraged 13 to 1, which is a normal commercial bank leverage, and they're, they have a very solid um, uh, equity base. So gold is propping up the Fed. Now, nobody will talk about that. I do explain it in the book. I, I take you through, uh, you know, I, I take the Fed balance sheet. I pull the line items out. Line items out. I do the math and I explain it analytically. So it's all there in chapter one of my book, The New Case for Gold. But but you know, I don't know what to say, uh, Chris. It's a great question. I guess it's just um, mis mis miseducation. Um, but we're trying to remedy that. Uh, I think with, with your program and your output and some interviews I do in my book, hopefully we can little by little have an impact. Uh, absolutely. I, I think it, it, it is spreading, of course, um, thanks to your great work as well and, and others. So uh, hey, this might be a little little geek moment here, but uh, you're the only person I know who might be able to answer this. Uh, you just mentioned that the Fed carries a lot of gold on its balance sheet. They carry it at the uh, rate of $11 billion, which is $42 an ounce and change, I think, if I have that right. right. And That's it correct. should really be $300 billion-ish under today's terms. When, when I wander over to the Treasury Department, I, I find that they also are recording $11 billion of the same gold on their balance sheet as an asset. How did two entities both record the same asset as an asset? Well, uh, it, it's a little bit of history there. For, first of all, um, let, let's just kind of go quickly through the history of how all the gold got confiscated and why we don't have it anymore. Um, you, you can Private citizens can buy gold. I, I tell people, look, don't wait for central banks to go on a gold standard. You can go on a personal gold standard. Just get some gold today. Uh, fortunately, we have the freedom to do that. Although, for, as you know, from 1933 to 1975, it was illegal for Americans to have gold. It was a crime. It was like having drugs or contraband. But but fortunately, that changed in uh, 75, and we can own gold today. So anyway, go back to 1912. People actually walked around with gold coins in their pockets, not all the time. There were silver coins. There was paper money. They were all kind of side by side in the marketplace. But, you know, people could pull out a $20 a one ounce gold coin and, you know, go shopping with it. Um, but in World War I, the banks hoovered up all the gold. Now, talking about commercial banks, and they melted it down and turned it into 400 ounce bars. So they said to people, okay, you can have gold, but by the way, we're, we're holding in these 400 ounce bars. Nobody's going to walk around. It's 35 pounds. Nobody's going to walk around with a 35 pound gold bar in their pocket. So people are like, okay, I got gold. I've got money that can be turned into gold, but the gold's in the bank vaults. That was step one. Step two, the Federal Reserve, after it was created in 1913, required all the commercial banks who own the Federal Reserve to give them the gold, meaning give it to the Federal Reserve. That was part of their investment in the Federal Reserve to get their stock. That's how they got to own the Federal Reserve. So now the gold is at the Federal Reserve. In the 1930s, during the Roosevelt administration, President Roosevelt ordered the Federal Reserve to hand it over to the Treasury. And that's why they built Fort Knox in 1937, because they were actually holding it at the Treasury building in, on Hamilton Place next to the White House before that. And they said, well, there wasn't enough room in the vault, so they built a new vault out of Fort Knox. So, so look at the sequence. First, the citizens have gold. Then the commercial banks have it. Then the Federal Reserve has it. Then the Treasury has it. And that's where the gold still sits. Now, here's the point. The Federal Reserve is privately owned. The Treasury is the United States government. It is unconstitutional under the Fifth Amendment for the government to take private property without just compensation. So when the Treasury took the Fed's gold, they had to give the Fed just compensation. So they gave them a gold certificate. That's what the Fed has on its balance sheet. It's not physical gold. It's a gold certificate equivalent to a certain amount. Now, what's, and so, that, so it's not double counting. The Treasury counts physical gold. And the Treasury counts a gold certificate backed up by the physical gold. But it appears twice, but it's not quite the same thing. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. And I talk about this in Chapter 1 of my book, 
the new case for gold. And you're, you're exactly right, Chris. Both institutions value it at $42 an ounce, approximately. We all know it's about $1,250 an ounce and it fluctuates. Take the uh, line item, take the historic cost value on the Fed's balance sheet, divide by 42. That gives you the number of ounces of gold. Convert that into tons, and guess what you get? 8,000 tons. How much does the Treasury have? 8,000 tons. It's no coincidence that the Treasury has the same amount of gold that the Fed says it has. In other words, the Treasury gold backs up the Fed. But this unlocks one of the great mysteries, something I've thought about for a long time, and I only recently solved it, and I, I talk about this in the book. Go back to 1950. The Treasury had 20,000 tons of gold. By 1970, we were down to 9,000 tons. Where did the 11,000 tons go? Well, it went to our trading partners under Bretton Woods. You know, the Germany, we were buying Volkswagens. Japan, we were buying transistor radios. They had trade surpluses. They could cash in their dollars and get the gold under Bretton Woods, and they did. 3,000 tons went to Germany, 2,000 to France, 2,000 to Italy, 600 to Netherlands, etc. Added up, that's where the 11,000 tons went. Now, between 1970, uh, and then we suspended redemptions in 1971. Between 1971 and 1980, the United States dumped another thousand tons in a futile effort to suppress the price of gold. And they did this, they twisted the IMF's arm. The IMF dumped 700 tons. So there was 1,700 tons of U.S. and IMF gold dumped between 1971 and 1980 to suppress the price. It failed the same way the London gold pool failed in the 1960s. The price skyrocketed to uh, $800 an ounce in January 1980. Then the Treasury stopped. The Treasury has not sold a significant amount of gold since 1980. In 36 years, they haven't sold any gold. So how is it the case that they go down 12,000 tons in 30 years between 1950 and 1980, and they go down zero tons in the 35 years, 36 years between 1980 and 2016? Well, the answer is the Treasury can't sell gold because they can't go below the 8,000 ton threshold because then they're violating their pledge to the Fed, which has that 8,000 tons on its balance sheet. What that means, it's highly significant because it means the, 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 the Treasury can't dump gold. The, the Treasury is out of the game in terms of gold suppression. And that's why they're going around getting everyone else to sell their gold. We got the UK to sell their gold in 1999. We got the Swiss to dump thousands of tons in the early 2000s. Poor Canada, they, they mm. dumped the last of their gold the other day. Um, so we've been going around getting everyone else to – oh, we got the IMF to sell 400 tons in 2010. So we're getting everyone else to sell their gold. I saw a report uh, just yesterday that poor El Salvador sold five tons. I mean, El Salvador is one of the poorest countries in the world, but they had to dump 5,000 5, tons. So we're running out of gold. The, the, the U.S. is getting everyone else to dump gold because the U.S. cannot dump gold because it can't go through that eighth ton threshold. The minute I did the conversion saw that the Fed was counting on eight tons and I knew that that was the Treasury number, it was like a light bulb went on and said, aha, so the U.S. is out of the game. Well, somebody's in the game, though, and uh, and and I think it, the game has changed slightly because you know a, a paper currency on on comics is certainly uh, now driving this. And uh, on the date of this taping, so we're, we're taping this on April first, two thousand sixteen. I'm looking at my screen. Gold's uh, taking another patented Friday swan dives down twenty bucks ish here at, at this moment. Uh, but of course, every student if, of gold knows that this would be the case today because the commercial short position, that's the bullion banks, had built up again to a near record uh, short position, which means that those uh, big bullion banks, they need the price to go down to make a, make a few bucks, right? Uh, make some money. And, and they never seem to lose. Uh, so the surprise, um, you know, the surprise weakness in the price of gold, it's nothing personal, right? It's just how these banks make money. We've all in the gold community been waiting forever for maybe this dynamic to change, but so far it hasn't. So it, it, it never seems to wash, rinse, repeat, right? The bullion banks win, they win again. What in your mind could change this? And, and is this a necessary condition to change for the price of gold to be unleashed so that people might take it more seriously? Well, it will change. Uh, here's the thing. Is there gold price manipulation going on? Absolutely. There's no question about it. I talk about this uh, in my, my book, The New Case for Gold. And that's not just an opinion. I spoke to a PhD statistician who works for one of the biggest hedge funds in the world. I can't mention the name, but uh, it's a household name. You would know the fund. Uh, so this guy's a PhD statistician. He looked at COMEX opening prices and COMEX closing prices for a 10-year period. And he was dumbfounded. He said, this is the most blatant case of manipulation I've ever seen. He said, if you just, if you just bought the close 
bought, uh, actually went into the aftermarket, bought after the close and sold before the open every day, you would make risk-free profits. Um, and he said, statistically, that's impossible unless there's manipulation going on. I spoke to uh, Professor uh, Rosa Branches Matz at the uh, New York University uh, Stern School of Business. She's the leading uh, expert on gold price manipulation. She actually testifies in some of these gold manipulation cases that are going on. She wrote a report, reached the same conclusion. So it's not just an opinion. It's not just a deep, dark conspiracy theory. Here's here's a PhD statistician and a prominent um, market expert lawyer, uh, expert witness in, in litigation qualified by the courts who independently reached the same conclusion. Now, Where's the manipulation coming from? Well, there are a number of suspects, but my number one suspect is China. Uh, and you say, wait a second, China's got 5,000 tons. Of course, they lie about it. They say officially they have 1,700 tons, but it's very easy to establish that China probably has 5,000 tons or more. Again, that's not a made-up number. How do we know? Well, we look at Hong Kong imports. China lies. Hong Kong doesn't. They actually have fairly reliable trade statistics. They're showing about 11, 1,200 tons um, a year. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, about seven or 800 tons a year of exports from Hong Kong to China. So, okay, so let's just say 800 tons a year there. And we have geological surveys that show China produces about 450 tons a year from the mining output. And we know they have zero exports. So combine uh, Hong Kong exports to China with Chinese indigenous mining output. You get a figure of about 12 or 1,300 tons a year times six years. So that's, um, you know, that's uh, 9,000 tons right there. And uh, so the only thing that's not clear is how much of that's public, how much of that's private. But I just met uh, recently, it was in Switzerland a couple of weeks ago, I met with the head of the world's largest gold refinery. His estimate is that is about 70% goes to private usage and about 30% to the government. So, you know, take the 9,000 tons, uh, apply 30%, you get 3,000 tons plus the 1,000 they admit. So you easily get to a figure of four or 5,000 tons. But here's the problem. China's got to get to 8,000 tons. If they want to look the U.S. in the eye, and have a big enough pile of poker chips the next time the major trading financial powers sit down to play poker and recut the deal and reform the international monetary system, they got to have as much gold as the U.S. So they're still out to buy another three or 4,000 tons. Now, ultimately, the price would go much higher. But if you were a buyer of 3,000 tons, wouldn't you want a low price? Of course you would. So, so they're, and, and by the way, they are untouchable by the CFTC, the Justice Department. We can't prosecute China. We can't get access to them. They would laugh at us. So, so you got a big whale out there buying thousands of tons through stealth and deception, motivated to have a low price, which is untouchable by U.S. regulatory authorities. So there's your, uh, there's your culprit right there. It's been a, a, just an absolute vast hoovering uh, sound coming uh, from the East in particular, you know, just China in particular, but, but India too. And uh, thank you for that wonderful description, by the way. I was talking with a, a gentleman who um, operates a refinery in Switzerland. And he says, yeah, they're still going three shifts. They're taking my, uh, physical gold out of London off the OTC market uh, almost as fast as they can and converting it into kilo bars and uh, three, nine kilo bars and sending it to China. And there it goes. That's been going on for a while. I've, I'm have i on record as saying that can't go on forever, but I'm surprised at the durability of that particular uh, process because it seems like it has to be sanctioned at some at some fairly high levels. I don't think the West... W- just doesn't pay attention and doesn't care, and you know thousands of tons are are leaving from the West heading east. Oh no, you're absolutely right. you're absolutely right. It is sanctioned. I, I spoke to again. I, I want to be careful. No, actually, uh, this this one's on the record. Um, I spoke to uh, Zhu Min, Dr. Zhu Min. He's the number two guy at the IMF. He's a deputy managing director. Reports to Madame Lagarde. Uh, an interesting figure. He was. Uh, you know, PhD economist. Um, actually, we went to the same school. Um, Zhu, Dr. Zhu uh, was uh, deputy governor of the People's Bank of China, so uh, basically central banker for the Communist Party of China. And today he's number two guy at the International Monetary Fund. So he's got a foot in both camps, a foot in the Chinese camp and a foot in the Western camp because the U.S. more or less controls the IMF. There's nobody who knows more about the inner workings of the international monetary system uh, than uh, than Xu Min. I spoke to him personally, and uh, I said, uh, I said, Xu, I said, um, uh, I have a question for you. I said, in 2010, you know, China bought a uh, thousand tons of gold, and the IMF sold 400 tons of gold. Who who's right? I said, you can't both be right. You got sellers and buyers. Somebody's on the wrong side of the trade. And he kind of shrugged and said, you know, China needs to do this. And he used a fascinating phrase. He said, China needs to rebalance their reserves from credit reserves to real reserves. And I almost fell out of my chair because 
with credit by credit reserves, he meant treasury notes because that's yeah. debt. That's debt. Treasury notes debt. So if you buy debt, you're giving credit. So those are credit reserves. And he actually, this is the number two guy at the IMF referring to gold as a real reserve. This isn't some you know fringe website. This isn't zero hedge. I mean, this is the IMF, right? So he says they need to rebalance their reserves from um, credit reserves to real reserves. So it is sanctioned at the highest levels of the IMF. I had a similar discussion. Uh, this one, I can't mention the name, but uh, I'll just say one of the highest ranking officials in the U.S. intelligence community. Uh, actually higher than the CIA because it's uh, that we're talking about the director of national intelligence which is which oversees the CIA uh, and I you know but can't mention the name but I said you know you know what's going on with China they're buying all this gold I mean you have the facts the facts aren't secret and he kind of looked at me and he shrugged and he said well somebody's got to own it as if it was a yard sale you know like I'm getting rid of my junk and you're going to come buy some stuff at my yard sale so the senior officials know about it they're very relaxed about it they think we need to do this well the question is why why does China need gold reserves? Well, obviously, you're going to reset the monetary system on a gold basis. If you do that, back to Churchill, 1925, you've got to get the price right. What is the implied non-deflationary price of gold in a reset monetary system? The answer is at the low end, $10,000 an ounce. At the high end, $50,000 an ounce. So it's coming. And then people say, oh, I'll, I'll wait till it goes. I hear you, Jim. Yeah, I agree with your argument, but I'll, hold, I'll wait until it starts to take off. Sorry, you're not going to be able to get the gold. It will take off. But you'll be sitting there on, watching it on television going to $2,000, $3,000, $4,000 dollars an ounce, frantically calling your dealer saying, get me some gold. And you know what the dealer's going to say? Sorry, sold out, back ordered. You call the mint, back ordered. You're not going to be able to get it. That's my point. So get it now while you can at a good entry point, not 100%. Get 10% of your assets. Sit tight. You'll be fine. Now, you keep saying uh, get 10% of your assets in there. Uh, I, I feel like you're, you're kind of talking to an individual uh, are you talking as well? I mean, would you recommend that, that every portfolio, are you including pensions, endowments, big money as well in, in that statement? Well, here's the thing, Chris. Um, by the way, I, do you know what percentage of U.S. reserves, we, we talk about Chinese reserves and Russian reserves. Do you know what percentage of U.S. reserves are in gold? No, I don't. 70%. Hmm. U.S. has 70% of its reserves in gold. And again, that's publicly available. Just go to the, uh, the Treasury Department, look at the reserve well, maybe, report. We're 70 the U.S. should have more reserves then, huh? Well, uh, <laughs> but I'm just telling you, the U.S. is way over my 10% allocation. Well, look, yeah, I, yeah, right. I was, uh, as I mentioned, I was in Switzerland. I did meet with the, uh, the head of uh, the world's largest gold refinery, but I was also there at a uh, kind of a high-end investor conference. These were the largest institutional investors from around the world. And when I, I arrived in Zurich, it was about a two-hour ride out into the Alps where the, this conference was at a great spa, but it was in the middle of nowhere in the Alps, kind of an interesting uh, Goldfinger-type location. But, uh, but I shared a car from the airport to the spa with the head of the Columbia, government of Columbia, um, basically their social security fund, but unlike our social security fund, theirs is actually funded. Like they've got real assets in it as opposed to, uh, phony promises. So, um, so this guy runs a $50 billion portfolio for the benefit of the people of Columbia. And I just said to him, how much gold do you have? And he said, zero. So, uh, and by the way, the institutional allocations worldwide are about one and a half percent. I think, uh, thanks to Kyle Bass, uh, University of Texas is bringing up the average a little bit, but, uh, yeah. but alloc allocations are pitifully small. So we can debate 10 percent, 30 percent, 50 percent, but the fact is the actual allocations are 1.5 percent, and we're talking tens of trillions of dollars. So if they only move the needle from 1.5 to 3, forget 10, forget 5, 3 percent. They would double the gold allocation. There's not enough gold in the world at anywhere near these prices to fill that order. So it, it, you don't have to go to 10%. Just move the needle a little bit, and you're talking about a buying panic and skyrocketing prices. And again, my point to investors is, you know, don't be, a, you know, commodities traders and hedge funds, they have what they call the trend following technique. They say, I'm going to wait till it takes off. Then I'm going to jump on. I'll miss some of the early move, but I'll be along for the ride. That's trend following. Fine. It works fine in liquid markets. But this won't be a liquid market. This will be panic buying. You won't be able to get the gold. And uh, I get well. I guess people could always say I could own proxy gold then. So I'll, I'll buy gold futures. I'll uh, I'll step in on one of the funds. They're always liquid or something like that. Uh, but they wouldn't actually have access to gold. Why, why wouldn't that work? Why Why couldn't somebody say I can always buy a gold future? Trust me. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I'm a you know I, you admit to being a bit of a geek. I'm definitely a geek. Um, I was. Uh, general counsel to one of the world's largest futures traders for a number of years and also worked in, in hedge funds that traded futures. I've actually read all the rule books of all the exchanges. And guess what? 
there's a rule that says they can change the rules. Uh, you know, everyone goes back to the Hunt brothers, 1980, and whines right. and says, "Oh, the, the the you know the the um, the metals exchange, uh, the NYMEX changed the rules on the Hunt brothers." But there's a rule that says they can change the rules. So here's what will happen, because you know you hear some of the gold bugs say, "Come on, all you long futures traders, stand up, take delivery. You know, you'll break the break the bank." No, you won't, because what will happen is, if a disproportionate number of the long futures positions in gold put in notice to take physical delivery. And of course, there's nowhere near enough gold in the COMEX warehouse to satisfy that. Everyone understands that. There's not supposed to be. First of all, they have a rule that says we are not a source of supply. The only reason they allow physical delivery at all is to kind of keep people a little bit honest about the paper price and maintain an arbitrage. But if you have a disproportionate number of uh, requests for physical delivery, they will issue an order that says, no, you can't take physical delivery. We're going to what they call trade for liquidation only. That means you can take your long future, you can close it out against a short, you can roll it over to a future month and a calendar spread, but you can't actually get the physical delivery. And they have a separate rule for what they call disorderly markets. When they have disorderly markets, they can do whatever they want. They can issue emergency orders. So they'll just say, sorry, no delivery, out of luck, you know, trade for liquidation, see you later. Gold ETF is even worse. Um, you know, when you buy, a, a, you know, G, I don't want to pick on GLD, it's the best known, but there are right. other ETFs out there. You buy a, a GLD, you don't own gold. You want to share a stock that's traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Now, that stock is in a, in a trust with authorized dealers, and they go out. <coughs> if, you want to, pardon me, if you want to liquidate, all you can do is sell your share to somebody else. You can't get the gold. Uh, the authorized dealers can, but they, just, they run a nice arbitrage game, kind of front-running their own customers. But even there, uh, when they get your money, uh, they've got, um, and again, this is all in the fine print of the ETF offering document, they've got 28 days to go buy the physical gold. Well, when do you think they're going to get caught short? It's not going to be when times are normal. It's going to be when there's a buying panic, they're going to have your money, and they're going to say, oh, geez, gold scar, better go buy some gold. Again, they're not going to be able to get it. And so they're going to have to suspend redemptions, and they are allowed to do that. And they won't steal your money. What they'll do is they'll send you a check for your profits, you know, for your profits as of the close of business yesterday. And you'll be sitting there watching TV saying, hey, it's up $200 an ounce today. What about that? And they'll say, sorry, you closed out as of you know, COB yesterday. Here's your check. Nice knowing you. It was exactly when you want the price exposures when you're not going to be able to get it. This is uh, you know, something we learned the hard way at Long-Term Capital Management. It's called, uh, my friend Myron Scholes uh, you know, uh, won the Nobel Prize for invention of the uh, black Scholes uh, pricing model. He called this conditional correlation, something that's not normally or usually correlated, but it becomes correlated upon the happening of a certain condition. In other words, uh, the time you want your price exposure to gold is the time you're not going to be able to get it unless you own physical. It sounds like the uh, s sort of a parallel inverse to derivatives. They work great as insurance until you actually need them as insurance. Correct. It's like, it's like you have fire insurance on your house and uh, the day before the fire breaks out, they cancel your policy. That's that's actually not not a joke. I mean, that's exactly the way these paper gold contracts work. And I said, I, I've read them. Believe me, I've sat down, I read the London Bullion Market Association standard gold purchase contracts for unallocated gold. It will hurt your head, but I've read it, and I've seen the force majeure clauses and the early termination clauses and what you have to go through if you want the physical. And by the way, they can also close you out before you ever get the physical. I've read the offering documents on GLD. I've read the rule book of the COMEX. Uh, I've read all this stuff. And again, it's the devil's in the details, but read the fine print. You'll find out that you'll never get your – not only will you never get your gold, you won't even get the price exposure when you most want it. Yeah, and that's that's going to be a tragedy for a lot of folks. And, and that's one of the reasons that I, I've been actively encouraging people to get gold, get physical gold in your hot little hands. Uh, and if you have to have it in an account, it's got to be a fully allocated uh, account with your name on it. With with Again, read the rule books, right? Re read very carefully what the conditions are because I, I think you're supporting a statement that, that – uh, from a from a from your own direction from a, a much deeper base of experience but but my one of my operating principles that I share with my listeners is you know when the going gets tough they're going to change the rules that's right and by the way Chris all of this everything we're talking about and I love this conversation I'm glad we're able to uh, to uh, put this out there on your program but all of this is in my book, The New Case for Gold. So the great thing for readers who, who buy the book, you don't have to read the rule book of the COMEX. You don't have to read an LBMA contract. Fantastic. It, it's all summarized in the book in plain English, and uh, I hope people enjoy it. Me too, and I'm really going to plug for it. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I've just downloaded it, but I'm going to read it, and, uh, and I will be uh, 
letting people know about it. So I'm sure it's it's packed with great uh, information and I got a lot out of Currency War. So I, I know it's going to be just a fantastic read. And uh, we've been talking with Jim Rickards, author of the newly released book, The New Case for Gold. And uh, Jim, thank you for a fantastic interview and uh, great uh, information. Thank you, Chris.